I'm Dr. Dan Rose. I uh, am currently the director of the Oral Health Initiative at Lakewood Health System, Lakewood Hospital in Staples, Minnesota. I've uh, been doing dentistry for about 40 years and uh, I first got involved with the integration of oral health and primary care when I was about two months out of dental school up in the little town of Red Lake Falls, Minnesota. And at that time, I was not only the only dentist in town, I was the only dentist in the county. And uh, I got a call about two o'clock in the morning and the local physician there, he was just out of medical school and I was just out of dental school. So we both knew about as much of what we were doing as uh, we did when we graduated from school. Anyway, there was an accident, and um, he said, Dan, would you come down here and help me? I said, well, okay, so I came down there, and it was an automobile accident, and he was stabilizing the patient and asked me if I'd sew his tongue back on. He had about half his tongue had been lacerated, and all I could think of was uh, thinking of uh, old Merle Holte, who said, whenever you're going to suture something, he said, put one in the middle, one on each end, and then put a suture in between, and if you need to put more, do it. And that's... And that was my uh, orientation, if you will, into uh, integrating oral health and primary care. The uh, young physician and I shared a building. The city gave us a building. So my dental clinic and his medical clinic were side by side. And uh, we worked very closely together. And that's where if, if, if I took vital signs and there was uh, high blood pressure, I'd just say, when's the last time you've seen your doctor? And a lot of times it was three or four years, or, oh, do I have high blood pressure? And the other way around, he started looking at things. And if there was an abscess or somebody came in with a toothache, he'd uh, come, has sent his nurse down, and they'd get me, and I'd go up to, uh, well, not up, just over, just through the door and into his clinic. And we had a great thing. And I, you know, right out of dental school, I thought, oh, this is the way dentistry's practice. I didn't know any different. But, um, my real uh, baptism, if you will, into integrating oral health and primary care was uh, a few years after I was in Red Lake Falls, I was invited to go to the country of Madagascar for four years and uh, all of a sudden became responsible for two hospitals, two leprosariums and a crippled children's home. And uh, I learned a lot about medicine. And now I, I've probably forgotten most of what I learned but I just understood very clearly the integration and the importance of oral health in the rest of the body. And uh, the slides that I have here, have, have anybody read this report, this white paper report? You don't even have to be here because all these slides come from that, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, get a copy of this report if you haven't got it yet. This is, it, it's a good primer on what we're going to be talking about. Oh, come on. No, this thing isn't good. Okay, I'm going here. Oh, my. Let me see. i got to do something else here. i got to get around so I can see where I'm at. The Department of Human Services has said the health care priorities in oral health is, in any part of the health care field is we need to strengthen the primary care delivery system, which is our number one thing. We need to invest in prevention, and that will lead us to reducing unnecessary costs. And that was some of the, the big uh, emphasis on selling the Affordable Care Act. And uh, there are those people who say that uh, we look at where we're at today, and we haven't really strengthened our primary care system. and, and uh, we aren't doing a real good job with prevention. We, we're talking about it a lot, and we're writing a lot of papers. But have we really reduced unnecessary costs? And uh, that's an argument for another day. Well, oral health is a silent epidemic. And, and this is a preacher talking to the choir left. I'm going to go through this fairly fast, because most of you know this stuff. But if you haven't, it's good to hear it for the first time and remember it. In 2000, that's 16 years ago, the oral surgeon's report on oral health said that oral health is a silent epidemic and we need to do something about it. And uh, in 16 years, we have talked about it a lot, but really haven't done a lot. So anyway, while they're working on that, I'll just say, what I want to say to you is that the time is now. You know, we, everybody in this room agrees with what I just said, I'm sure, but why haven't we moved the needle? 
And uh, part of it is, is that I believe, and I mentioned to a few people as we've talked to earlier, I think we've got things turned upside down. Because we've got, you know, we, we've got the providers, then we have the payers, then we have the policy makers, and then we have the advocates or the, uh, the patients. We've always come from the top down and said, if you give us money to do this, then we're going to make sure that you change the policy and then uh, people will get care and then we won't have people upset. Well, my argument is, is that we need to find advocates to come from the bottom up to, to, to convince policymakers that things need to change so that then the policymakers will uh, get the money to the payers so that then the providers can provide the service. I work in a small hospital in Staples, Minnesota, a little 25-bed critical access hospital. And um, I see special needs patients in the OR. We are in the process of an expansion, a two-year, $20 million expansion of our little hospital. And when that's completed, we hopefully will have a dental clinic where we will hire a general dentist, a pediatric dentist, an RDH, a CT, or a CDT, I don't know what they call them, CD, anyway. Um, and uh, a community health worker. So the presentation just before lunch was really, really on target. That's what we need. And we're looking, we're about three years away from that at uh, Lakewood. We have to admit that oral health certainly impacts general health. I uh, have notes here on my slides and Again, something that we all know that dental health is probably the most common chronic disease that's untreated in this country. Oh, I got this one here. Huh? Oh, yeah, I've got a handout here. If you, my slides are on a handout. I've got about 20 of them here if you want them. So, Well, young people, two to five years old, how many of them have dental caries? Probably about 25%. You move up the next age group, you're probably about 50%. And uh, again, those are things you already know. When we look at the cost of things, and it's going to take a cost, there's going to be a cost in making this happen. I have said too to a number of you as we've shared here today, I said, it is my belief after my 10 years at working with Lakewood Health System that every critical access hospital in the state of Minnesota and probably nationwide should have an oral health unit. When you look at the amount of monies that's spent in an emergency room for non-traumatic, acute, and non-urgent oral health conditions, in 2010, 2.1 million visits, 867 million, you know, that's a lot. I tell the story about, uh, any time I talk about this, I tell the story about a uh, uh, our ER physician came in one morning and I came in and he said, Dan, he said, I admitted a lady last night, would you go up and see her? And I did, and I said, well, what's the thing? And once she came in and she was having difficulty breathing, she was all swollen on the left side, it was developing Ludwig angina, and I went up and they had her on IV antibiotics, and so I visited with her, and we looked into the medical history, and, and it's PTSD, depression, uh, borderline personality disorder, had no primary care physician, and couldn't remember when she'd ever been to a dentist. And uh, so where's our, you know, where's our oral health worker? You know, this is a perfect case of what we talked about this morning. People were talking to someone to help facilitate this person. What we did, we kept her on antibiotics for about three days and then put her on uh, an oral regime of antibiotics, got her into our OR because she could not uh, tolerate treatment at the clinical level, took out the remains of uh, teeth 18 and 19 and also number 17 kept her on antibiotics when she left and we haven't seen her again. Where is she at? Somewhere in the ether. Probably hasn't been back to the dentist. But had we not been there and had this exchange with my ER doc, they would have put her on IV antibiotics for three or four days, put her on antibiotics when she left. She would have completed that 10 days or 14 days of antibiotics and then two or three months later would have showed up at another emergency room someplace because she might have had difficulty breathing. So the integration of oral health and primary care is, is just essential in my opinion. 
And, you know, we have a hard time separating the mouth from the rest of the body. And that's part of our problem as dentists because we're trained in silos. And it's trouble with our medical profession because they're trained in silos. And that's trouble with our nursing profession because they're trained in a silo. So it's the design of the training program, and it's our professional identities. Let's go back. When I graduated from dental school 40 years ago, dentistry was considered what we call the cottage industry. You were out there on your own, you know, and the, the generation before me, it was the dentist's office above the pharmacy in the small town in Minnesota. The payment structure is a real problem and the delivery systems. And again, that's why I say that every critical access hospital in the state of Minnesota should have an oral health unit. The payment structure as it exists is totally inadequate. And uh, that's where we've always emphasized going, whereas I say we need to get some advocates and come from the bottom up. Well, I'll just continue on talking about some other things, and I don't know if I'm doing this in the sequence I have the slides up there, but our primary care physicians, you know, they do a cardiology review on every person when they come in for an exam, right? They talk about obesity, they talk about uh, whether or not you have an adequate diet, they talk about whether or not you smoke, and they, did you get it? Yeah. And uh, it's amazing how many physicians don't realize, and this is not a criti criticism of my uh, uh, colleagues in the, or, uh, in, the, in the general health field, they know that medications affect salivary flow, but They've got so many other things on their plate, they weren't really worried about it. And um, all of these things actually are included in an oral health visit. So our, our primary care physicians need to do oral health screenings and they need to have a referral mechanism to a dentist. That's, I believe, one of the areas we, of primary concern. Right now, if one of my PCPs, primary care physicians, is going to refer to a specialist, they're going to ask for a solution to a problem or information regarding a problem. And there's a protocol for that, and there's a referral system that's in place and a standard uh, uh, protocol. There is no such protocol from referring from medicine to dentistry or dentistry to medicine. Because a physician refers to uh, someone if I referred to Amos for um, some pediatric uh, patient that I have, he would expect me to have information for him. I would expect to get a report back, and he would re expect that I would acknowledge that he sent me a report. You know, that doesn't exist at the present time as far as protocol, and that's part of the educational and training system. <clears throat> Oral health screening doesn't take too long, okay? And the mouth should be treated just like any other organ system. You look at the teeth, you look at the gingiva, you look at the oral mucosa, and the tongue. I didn't put the tongue on here, but I should have. <clears throat> oral disease so very often is either minimized or discounted. And the oral surgeons report again 16 years ago, the mouth is the mirror of the body. And uh, it's amazing that in my time at Lakewood, I've heard that stated by my PCPs more than once. Oh, yeah, the mouth tells me what else is going on. This is a patient that uh, one of the PCPs asked if I'd look at those teeth that were tipped. You want to know something? Take a look at that. Those aren't teeth that are tipped. There are the teeth right there. This thing isn't working. The teeth are right there at the top of those teeth. That's calculus that's tipped out. And it, when they smiled, it looked like teeth. Well, we ended up putting this person in, in uh, the OR and uh, debrided the area and ended up taking about five or six teeth out. Periodontal disease, again, the unrecognized burden of oral disease. Periodontal disease, periodontitis, gum disease, whatever you want to call it. Over time, and this is interesting, bacterial toxins and body's natural response break down bone and connective tissue, resulting in tooth loss. 
I remember 40 years ago or more in dental school learning that more teeth are lost to periodontal disease than to decay. You know, that's still true today, 40 years later. How about this one? Gosh, Dan, I need to get this guy a toothbrush. No, he needs more than that. Look at the color of the gums. He's a diabetic, and he doesn't brush his teeth. He's got problems. You can read that as well as I can, but I think it's a, this is an important slide to, to share. When, when I shared this with uh, my colleagues, they, they just kind of, really, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I think that 30, 40 years ago, again, I keep talking historically because that's where I come. I come from history. Um, we knew a lot of this stuff, but we didn't have as much research, you know, really validating that as we do today, especially within the last five or six years. I've already mentioned this, but uh, we all remember DeMonte Driver, young lad out in Baltimore. How many, how many years ago was that? 15 years ago? Young lad died from an abscessed canine. Look at all the places that we have isolated uh, oral bacteria from. Reduction in quality of life. This one really strikes me, especially when it comes to children. Um, when a child doesn't eat well or can't eat well, you know, they may not going to grow quite as well. And um, appearance and self-esteem is a big thing. I don't know how many dentists do I have here in the room, and dental hygienists and dental assistants. You can all tell me a story of somebody that you've changed their life by fixing their teeth. And. Um, this appearance and self-esteem is, is more than you realize, I, I, or I mean, I realize it over time, but at the time when I first saw it, I thought, wow, gee whiz. Now I look back at it and I think of those people that came in and kind of hanging down and depressed. And we have a lot of folks out there that, that have problems, like the lady I mentioned. I see a lot of PTSD. I see a lot of uh, uh, depression, severe depression. I see a lot of borderline personality. I see bipolar disorder. All these folks functioning very well in society, but with very low self-esteem. Two things, either they feel they're unattractive, because maybe they are, or they're dealing with pain, so they aren't able to deal with their mental issues as well. Those are things we need to remember. School absence, work absence. Disadvantaged children, ages five to eight, Missed over two days just because of their oral health. Parents of disadvantaged children, two and a half days. Students with toothaches are four times likely to have a lower GPA. Hard to study when you don't feel good. Or you wake up in the morning and, and your tooth is aching and it's just part of living. You don't know any different. Consequences should not be minimized. And. Um, the statement that oral complications reflect and exacerbate may even initiate other health problems. And they can have a profoundly negative impact on the quality of life. And that's what I was just saying about self-esteem and, and presentation. This is a fellow that was referred to me because he wasn't eating really well. Happens to be a nursing home patient. And they said he isn't eating. And uh, he didn't have end-stage dementia. He his, his organs weren't shutting down, he just didn't want to eat, okay? So they wanted to know if we'd see him. Do you think there might be a problem there? Can you see anything that might be causing him some problems? But I'm asked to look and see if I could see anything that might be causing a problem, okay? You don't have to be a dentist to figure out that. Late-stage interventions, 
and just common sense stuff. Number of dollars that are spent, risk to the patients, and uh, when we when we treat things when they're at the stage of that last slide you just saw, you know, it's not addressing the underlying cause of the disease. Harmful bacteria, ineffective oral health, uh, self-care, lack of treatment, and an unhealthy diet. Here is one of the problems. Only 15 states, Minnesota happens to be one of them, that have a Medicaid program that includes adults. There's a coverage gap, only 40% of the U.S. population, in other words, two and a half times more than those lacking medical insurance. Challenge regarding underserved populations, we heard that so well this morning listening to folks. This is just repeating that same thing. Health literacy, social cultural factors, oral professional shortage areas. 45 million is equal to the population of the entire U.S. West Coast have a shortage of oral health care providers. And here is a key. Here's one of the keys of why we need to get involved with our primary care providers. Because more Americans are, are, are likely to see their primary care physician than they are to visit a dentist. And the primary care setting is not just the physician. You've got nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurse midwives. All of those folks can have a role and should have a role. They all have the skills, they have the resources, they have the tools, their scope of practice covers it. And the big thing is time. And there's a real complementary role for primary care and dentists. This isn't asking physicians to do our job, it, as, it isn't asking us to do the physician's job. The fact is, is that we're all involved with providing health care. The, two, the job is really too big for just one discipline to do. Physicians don't spend enough time in school to know how to do an MOD on number 14. They don't even know what number 14 means. I don't have the skills to decide what medication I should give to Johnny because of the fact that he's, he's a hypertensive and, or maybe he's a hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, you know. Uh, I, I look at lab things before they go into the OR and I just look and see if it's high or low and then I know whether or not I should be concerned. I'm being a bit facetious when I say that, but there are roles for both parties in that. Oral disease and dental disease, and I divided these up, and that's what they did in this, in this study, in this white paper. Oral disease is the unhealthy condition of the soft tissue and the teeth. In other words, oral cavity, okay? Dental disease is limited to teeth and gums. I'm not eliminating the fact if you see a white spot developing on the side of a tongue or you've got something else going on, but you're going to refer that probably to an oral surgeon for a biopsy. Most of our oral surgeons today are OS, DDS, MDs, right? We have a place to do that. <clears throat> so here's oral disease. So dentists and physicians need to be able to handle this list. Okay. And it all makes sense. We all palpate, you know, the lymph nodes here and we go back up here along the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid and we look at all that stuff and then there's lumps and bumps where they shouldn't be. We should be able to refer to our physicians to help us with that or to our oral surgeons or uh, other specialists. I work real close with our ENT uh, fellow that comes to Lakewood once a week, and uh, it's been a real blessing for me. Dental disease limited at teeth, you know, you've got caries, gingivitis, and periodontal disease. If we as dentistry could solve that, we would be a long ways toward uh, being out of work, and we've been trying to do that for 150 years. But we're also involved with oral health, and that's a state of being that you're free from all this stuff. 
Now I'm going to tell you a story give you, to give you an example. This is a fellow I consider a friend, and, and he is. We, we hunt together and that type of thing. And, and uh, here about a week or so ago, I was going down the hallway, and he said, Dan, come in here a minute. I want to curbside you once. You know, he, you know, I said, what you got? I thought he was going to ask me about a patient. He pulls his lip down, and he says, you know, he said, I go through a tin, about a tin a week. He said, I don't know. Do you think I should do something about this? And I said, well, you should stop. Well, I know that, he said. And uh, he said, is this important? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll just say Jerry. That's not his name. But I said, look, I said, I'll tell you what, stop. I said, and then if that's not gone in about seven days, you let me know, and we'll take a piece of that tissue and send it to somebody to look at. You really mean that? I said, well, let's just see. Okay? Now, he knew better, but he liked having that whatever it was stuck in there, and it's harder to quit chewing than it is to quit smoking. But he did, or at least he said he did. And uh, he showed me his lip just the other day, and it's gone back to normal. It doesn't look like the inside of a chicken gizzard. Anybody here from the farm know what a chicken gizzard looks like? Our primary care providers can do all of this, and you know what? A lot of this can be done by staff. It doesn't have to be done by the physician. Um, doing initial oral health assessment can be done by staff and identifying the patients in need, implementing preventive measures. Um, developing a partnership. You know, we, we need to identify patients at elevated risk. Like I mentioned, way back 38, 39 years ago, when uh, a friend of I, mine and I, we had patients going back and forth between each other and uh, inter did a lot of intervention with, especially with high blood pressure. This, this slide, I hope you can read it. This, is, this again comes from the uh, study. But I think take a look at that and see, this is the medical side over here and this is the dental side over here and here's in between. It just makes good common sense. I had one of my colleagues ask me some time ago, he said, uh, what do you think about putting uh, fluoride varnish on teeth? Do you think that's a good thing? I said, well, yeah. Well, he said, how come dentists don't do it? I said, they do. I said, it's a standard of care. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, well, how come I see patients that don't have any idea what it is? I said, maybe they haven't been to a dentist. He said, oh. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, it, so it's a communication thing. And, and uh, primary care providers can be a starting point for good oral health. That's just a simple, honest statement. If you can initiate oral health care in a primary care setting, it's going to expand access for most patient populations, particularly high-risk groups. That's what we were talking about this morning with the CMHs, or CHM, anyway, who are they? The oral health coordinators, I call them. But, um, but, and I mentioned this before, that the primary care teams have the skills and tools for engaging patients and families in self-care practices. Primary care teams have the expertise in care coordination. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how many people will go see their primary care physician, but they won't see their dentist. They don't have a dentist. Part of it is the structure of how we pay for things. And uh, these all make sense, but you know, you look at this 50% uh, of pregnant women with a dental problem visited, only 50% visited dentists during their pregnancy. 70% of pregnant women visit their primary care physician within the first trimester, and another 20 to 25% visit during the second trimester. I was just talking, who was I, where's she at? Our hygienist from Wilmer. Yeah. You know, she's working on this integrating oral health with primary care. We just visited her before I started. This is exactly what we're talking about. She works with, oral, uh, she works with dental hygiene students that come to the University of Minnesota clinic there in Wilmer in the OB, OB unit visiting with expectant moms, providing them with uh, oral, not only oral hygiene care, but oral hygiene education, one of the key things, am I right? Educating them on, on what it means. 
diabetes. There's a fellow who went to a diabetes counseling session, spent seven hours, a whole day, and at the end of the day, oral health was never mentioned. Yeah. So, and, and again, that's not throwing stones at these folks, you know. This is uh, just the way it is. Hypertension. You know, a lot of, lot of blood pressure meds have an effect on salivary flow. And so what do we do about all this? The challenge is to determine the best way to fit each component of service into the daily workflow. Maximize the value of the service to the patient and the family and minimize the disruption to all other health care priorities. That's a key because, as I mentioned before, it's time. But I want to just mention behavioral health and oral health, keeping the minds and mouths healthy. It's amazing. As the more I'm in this, I realized that oral health and behavioral health, you know, they were separated from primary care and silos for many, many years. Mental health has now moved into primary care where it should be, just like oral health should be. But there were separate cultures and barriers, not even sharing clinical information in the past. So I put this picture up. There's some old silos, right? And you can say whichever one you want to say is oral health and which one is mental health, but they're both still functional, right? They've just been there a while. They're just out in the field all by themselves. And uh, both frequently affect the young with lifelong consequences if left untreated. Chronic medical conditions and uh, left, and, left on and undertreated, both behavioral and oral morbidities limit the effectiveness of treatment for a broad range of common diseases. Again, the one that we see, we, we see uh, I see a lot of uh, group home folks, you know, I, the autistic and the severely mentally uh, limited and uh, cerebral palsy and, and those folks. But more and more and more, we're, I'm seeing on referral from physicians and dentists, folks like I mentioned before, that are functioning well in society because of their medications, but they have not taken care of their oral health. And, and that's a sad thing, but uh, in our little hospital, we're doing that with change. We've changed some folks' lives, and, and that's a blessing to me. So here we go. We built some new silos, right? Cleaned up the old ones and built some new ones. And that's, that doesn't mean they're bad because they, do, they function well, but uh, they have a purpose, and I just thought that would be interesting. Like that. So how did the oral health delivery framework? This is what I think we need to focus on with our primary care providers. We need to start talking to them. We need to, tell, they, they need to do these five things. They need to ask, they need to look, they need to decide, they need to act, and they need to document. So ask about oral health and risk factors and symptoms of oral disease. You know, oral dryness, looking at the meds that are there, pain or bleeding in the mouth, oral hygiene and dietary habits, length of time since a patient last saw a dentist. They can be this can all be done verbally or included in a written health risk assessment. This can all be done before the physician comes in the room. This can all be done, you know, at least have that initial sheet filled out, whether it be orally or actually checking things off on a list. Look, look for signs that indicate oral health risk or active oral disease. Access whether or not the mouth is dry. Lift up the tongue and look at it. Uh, you know, I showed you that picture of the guy with moss on his teeth and, you know, bright red gums. That doesn't take a whole lot to realize that that person probably has some periodontal problems. Then you go a little further and find out he's also a diabetic. Uh, white spots or cavities, you know. Gum recession, periodontal inflammation. Examine the oral mucosa and the tongue for signs of disease. Again. That takes about 30 seconds. Decide the most appropriate response. I'm talking about the primary provider now. Review the information gathered. Share the results with the patient or the family. 
when you're reviewing the rest of the exam, you review the oral uh, uh, exam. Determine the course of action based on the screening and assessment questions. Findings of the exam and the values, preferences, and goals of the patient and family. So what you're going to do, whether you're evaluating because they've got a cough or whether or not they got a sore leg or whatever. Come on. There we go. Act. By delivering preventive interventions and or placing an order for a referral to a dentist or a medical specialist. If there's a white spot on the side of the tongue, maybe they want to send it to uh, an oral surgeon. Maybe they want a dentist to look at it. Or like my friend said, Dan, should I be concerned about this? Dietary counseling to protect teeth and gums, promote uh, control for patients with diabetes, oral hygiene training, therapy for tobacco, alcohol, and drug addiction. A lot of those things are done already for other reasons, and it ties right in with oral health. Document the findings and structured data to organize information for decision, decision support, measure care processes, monitor clinical outcomes so that the quality of care can be managed. That can be included in a note, and so when the patient comes back for their next exam or to deal with their headaches or whatever it is has, it's in there again and the primary care physician or his or her nurse or uh, a physician's assistant can see that note in there and look at that particular thing and say, oh, well, what have you done about this? Maybe they're a diabetic and they're in because uh, things are going wacky and it's been about five or six months since they've been in and you open up the mouth and they haven't done anything with their oral hygiene. Something needs to be done. So, with the ex and I know I'm repeating myself, but with the exception of, of medical changes or medicine changes uh, to the patient's uh, oral health, all of the interventions appropriate for primary care can be delivered by non-clinician members of the primary team. Okay. Here is the incremental approach. And again, if you haven't gotten a copy of this white paper and you're interested at all, I think you should get it. It's online. You can print it out. And uh, so if you're, if you're talking to your local primary care physician or, or whoever you're talking to in the medical field, you know, tell them you don't have to bite the whole thing off at once. Start small. You know, begin with screening patients for signs and symptoms of early disease. Develop a structured referral process for dentistry. That last part, develop a structured referral process for dentistry. I think it's probably easier to do in small town Minnesota maybe than it is in uh, big town Minnesota, but most of your dentists in big town Minnesota serve a particular community. You know, it's just, big towns are just made up of a lot of little towns tucked together. Fluoride varnish, certainly for pediatric patients. Consider fluoride varnish for high-risk adults. I, I go beyond that. I say not consider it. You should, for high-risk adults, be placing fluoride varnish. <coughs> and then talk about risk assessment and risk reduction, dietary counseling, oral hygiene training. Identify a high-risk patient population. Maybe that's the first thing. Just say, I'm going to focus on children. I'm going to take, or, or we're going to do, uh, work with our OB staff, and we're just going to do pregnant moms initially, so we can get this system down and work out the bugs, rather than trying to do everything all at once with everybody that comes through the door. Because the big bugaboo is time. A structured referral, you know, I get some referrals from physicians and dentists. Actually, our little clinic in Staples, Minnesota, visiting with some of you earlier, we have literally seen patients from International Falls to Worthington and from Moorhead to Duluth and everywhere in between. I can show you the map. Because the next closest place is HCMC or the University of Minnesota. Uh, our pediatric dentists do a good job, you know, in our local hospitals. And so I have, arbit not arbitrarily, I've made the decision that I really don't see anyone uh, younger than 12 or 14 years of age because we've got good pediatric dentists. 
There have been times that uh, one of our local pediatric dentists will call me and say, Dan, can you see this kid? You know, maybe he's 10 years old um, because they're just so backed up, but they need to be seen and then, then I'll see them. But part of it is, is my armamentarium, I've really limited it. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be going pulpotomies and stainless steel crowns on six-year-olds because then I wouldn't have any time. Believe it or not, our little clinic up in Staples, Minnesota, and I just see OR patients, my consultation schedule and my, oral, uh, my operating room schedule is out into January. And I'm three days a week in the OR. So that says there's a need out there. And I'm just talking about the high risk population now. I'm not talking about those that are having difficult accessing care. Lakewood Health System is going into a $20 million expansion program and in that plan is for a dental clinic and that'll probably be two, three years in the making because they've just broke ground now. But at that point, we'll be wanting to hire a pediatric dentist, a general dentist, a uh, dental therapist, a hygienist, and an oral health worker or community health worker or whatever you want to call them. Somebody to help these folks navigate the system. I think it's so important. But I get referrals and I'll have the patient's name and I'll have the guy that sent it and said, can you do their work? And they come with a driver and they're from 160 miles away. You know, you really, you need to educate your folks. If you're going to get into this, you need to educate physicians and dentists alike that uh, we need to know some stuff. It really helps us. Um, my, my assistant is on the phone every week getting medical histories and radiographs and everything else. For some reason, they think we just know what to do. I don't know. Um, also, another thing is, is that in the last thing there, I'd like a statement on the referral that says that the patient is healthy enough for me to see him in our little 25-bed critical access hospital. Just yesterday, I saw a fellow who was... Uh, um, so medically compromised, he's going to be needed seen at a tertiary facility, such as the University of Minnesota or uh, a major hospital. And uh, I, can, I, I, I tell this story too about, this is about a year or so ago. In January, I um, had a lad come in who's uh, from a group home. I'd seen him every year for the last three or four years. But he had had an MI and was scheduled for surgery and was asked to make sure he was periodontally, you know, in good shape to go through the surgery. He had to have, have, have periodontal maintenance done. And I told the uh, group home administrator who came with him that I said, uh, he really needs a cardiology workup. And, a, and she got angry with me. Well, Dr. Rose, you've seen this patient for the last three or four years. How come you can't see him now? You're telling me you're not going to see him? I said, no, no. I said, he just needs to have a cardiology workup. So we got a cardiology workup. And uh, our anesthesia department reviewed it and says, you know, we can't touch this guy. Not only has he got problems with his heart, he's also uh, early COPD, and he's got a few other things going on there that we, we just can't do that here. And so I let the group home folks know, and they got upset with me again because I wouldn't see him. And I said, well, I said, let me get hold of the uh, University of Minnesota General Practice Residency Program. This is a year ago. And so I gave him the number and I sent my referral down. And uh, Dr. Rutger and I happened to meet a month or two later because we were talking about telehealth and getting that involved. And so we were meeting and I brought this case with me. And I said, this is an example of a really good case where we could do this consultation with telehealth so that the patient doesn't have to come down and see you, go back up another 110 miles. That's, so that's 250 miles from Minneapolis and then go back down for treatment. And Mark says, well, he said, let's just have the consultation right now because I had the radiographs and the record and all that. And uh, he said, uh, I, I can make it. But see, the thing is, is that you get to send a referral to a major institution like that. It goes to administration and then it goes to the scheduler and they put it in the schedule. And his consultations are out like two months. And uh, as Mark said to me, he said, well, he said, we can always find a spot to put somebody if I know, you know, that we need to see him like this because he was supposed to have this heart surgery as soon as possible. So anyway, Mark saw him, but interesting thing is, is that he was seen there on the, they didn't see him on the West Bank, they saw him in the main hospital on the East Bank with the head of anesthesia doing the anesthesia 
and cardiology standing by. So did we do the right thing? Yeah. So I mean, there's uh, that part of it too that, that we face in, in small hospitals out there. We need, a, we need a referral place to go and we need to have adequate information. Um, this is one of the things I try to tell my referring physicians and dentists is that um, I want, I, I, I'll let them know that the patient's been scheduled when I get a referral and uh, let them know that the patient is scheduled and once the patient is seen, we always send them a report of what we did. And uh, that's just good sense, and that's just good medicine or good health care, whatever you want. It's going to take time, going to take an effort. And then for these relationships to be successful, we dentists need to remain open for caring for patients of mixed insurance status. That status is, I don't know how that got in there, but, but status it should be. Um, you know, I would just say 98% of the people I see are Medicaid patients. One of the difficult things we are is our Medicare patients that are referred to me, uh, they don't may, may or may not have Medicaid because they haven't had, quote unquote, have and had any dental problems, so why even worry about the Medicaid thing? Because Medicare is taking care of things for them, and then uh, we've got a real problem. But that's a historical problem. Back in the 1960s or whenever it was that we decided we were going to have Medicare, uh, dentistry didn't want to have any part in it. So that's another historical problem. I think that you can go to the ICD codes, and I just listed some of them for our medical folks when they do their screenings or their oral health evaluation. They can, uh, well, you know, the, the thing of the, a, uh, the primary health home, or, or uh, we need also to expand that from a, a medical home to include an oral health medical home as well. That should be included in it. Dr. John Helfen, who's our chief of staff at Lakewood, was integral in, in establishing that. He's one of the leaders here in Minnesota as far as establishing a medical home and uh, actually spoken nationally on, on things to do it, which fits into the plan for the future. So we're just an extension of that and building on that. So we're fortunate to be where we are. No, really, one of the things I wanted to mention is this thing about time. They're going to say about time. You mean you're adding something else on. And, and our primary care physicians are really pushed for time. You know, it's, you know the, some places, you know, they've got 10 minutes to be in there. If they're in there for longer than that, the administration gets upset because they aren't producing. Or they say, you've got seven minutes with this patient or whatever. Um, that's one of the difficulties that we have. But when a team, a, a dentist and a... Um, I mean, pardon me, a physician and a, uh, and a PA, physician's assistant, when they got the system going, it only took, added two or three minutes to the uh, oral health exam or to the, uh, to the well person clinic. Uh, so so it, isn't, it isn't unassailable. It's realistic and it can be done. I, uh, I did have a slide in here that said that, uh, well, maybe we're going to have to see something. Yogi Berra said, uh, if you don't know where you're going, you're bound to end up somewhere. And that's really true. I think we know where we're going. I think we know where we're supposed to go. And it would be my hope that as time goes by, that we can report to people that we actually are integrating oral health and that the mouth is the mirror of the body and it is actually an organ system. You know, teeth are organs, just like a kidney is an organ. And... Um, just to review again, I said, you know, we've got the providers, we've got the payers, policymakers, and then we've got the advocates or the patients on the bottom. And we need to turn it around so that our patients start advocating to have their oral health cared for so they can affect the policymakers. Because if I, as a dentist, especially being the past president of the Minnesota Dental Association, I open my mouth about dollars and right away I'm a mercenary. Whereas I believe that we can take I don't care how many million dollars it costs. I really don't. 
I mean, we have a tremendous portion of the population of this state that does not get adequate oral health care. And we have a shortage of dentists in rural area. Not only that, we have a shortage of dentists that actually do hospital care because there's no reimbursement. And hospitals can make money doing other stuff better than they can just doing dental care, oral health care. So you've got the provider side and you've got the administrative side. And the administrative side always has to report to their board that they're making money. And if you can make more money um, in podiatry than you can in dentistry, you're probably going to do focus on podiatry. And that's not to discount my podiatry friends. But uh, that's, that's the clarion call to this group, is that you're at the grassroots. And I, and I would hope that you start talking about this to the people that you interact with in your clinics whether it be dentists, physicians, physician's assistants, or even the Board of Dentistry. <laughs> okay. So with that, is there any questions? I don't know where we're at in time. Oh, we're, we're in good time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dan, for your presentation. I'm curious, you're, you're You've mentioned your case selection for operating room general cases. Mm -hmm. What about for those that are better candidates for IV sedation? What is your? What is my thought about IV sedation versus OR treatment, right? And what's available. And what's available, okay. Well, this is Dan Rose, and this comes from an uh, anesthetist, not a nurse anesthetist, an anesthetist at the University of Minnesota when I was there at the University at the School of Dentistry and we're talking about this. He said, Dan, what do you think of IV sedation? I said, well, if it's done in a hospital by a nurse anesthetist, I'm okay with it. I'm not okay with um, sedation in the outlying areas. And uh, so, yes, we do do some, but I still use the OR. My anesthesia team will, will come in and we maybe use some Versed or maybe do ketamine or something like that. But if I'm going to do a, uh, a, a comprehensive exam, a full mouth set of x-rays, restore 11 teeth and take out seven teeth, we're going to intubate them. Because when I put them in the OR, we're going to do everything from A to Z. And when they leave my OR, I've taken care of, I've, I've, I've uh, eliminated infection, I've treated the disease, and I may have established some function. And then we'll educate the caregiver or the family. So that's the stool that we stand on. So I don't know if I answered your question or not. I'm not a big fan of IV sedation that's done by a non-anesthetist. Our oral surgeons in most of their offices where they use IV sedation, they have a nurse anesthetist administering it. If I'm in a local dental clinic out there, start putting needles in people's arm, and I'm concentrating on taking a tooth out or restoring a tooth, I'm not necessarily watching on the monitor you know, keeping track of what's there. So that's my personal feeling. I think people are better cared for in a hospital setting with a nurse anesthetist or an anesthesiologist. Does that make sense? So I don't know if you're a big believer in that. But no, I, uh, like say Versed, ketamine, some of those things, we do that all the time. The, the reason I was asking, um, I'm with Apple Tree Dental. We have an IV sedation program in that outpatient setting, but we use nurse anesthetists yeah. along with our IV sedation certified dentists. Amen. So I agree with what you were saying. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hopefully you heard what she said. She said, you know, she's a certified uh, an, uh, in, in, in dental anesthesia, in anesthesia as a dentist, but also has a nurse anesthetist on staff. Yeah, because they're watching the vitals. Correct. You're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with everything you've said today. I think we should stop talking about a medical home and a dental home, and we should start talking about a health home. Amen, brother. I also, th and if my, and my professional academy, the Academy of Pediatrics, won't give up on the medical home. That's unfortunate. Uh, but we, I think it's also very important to emphasize that for children, at least nationwide, 
15 times more kids are seen by general dentists than by pediatric dentists. And according to my dental public health friends, most general dentists have never, had, have never seen a one or two year old in dental school. So they have no comfort level. They tell mothers three or four is a good time to start dental care. That's when they become comfortable with that child. By that time, 40 to 50% of these kids can have cavities. There's a role for the primary care medical provider to do something starting with day one of after birth. Bigger problem is getting the obstetricians to get involved during maternity care. Yep. Yep. They, they, have, they are re quite resistant. I've gone all the way to the top of ACOG and got nowhere. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Do you hear what Amos was saying? Is that, you know, we need to start at day one. And that's why I really endorsed what she's doing over there in, in Wilmer getting involved before the child is born. And then really when, it, it, when you're in your general practice, just building on what you said, mom comes in and she's pregnant, right? When that, and let them know when your child's born, we wanna see your child. We wanna see that. We wanna see if there's any anomalies there that need to be addressed early. And we need to talk to mom about rubbing on the gums and treating them. When that first tooth is erupted, we wanna start getting some fluoride varnish on there on an annual basis. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, toothbrush and fluoride toothpaste, you know, that does wonders. So it used to be, you know, well, we'll start seeing those kids when they're five, six years old, because then we can talk to them, right? But you know, they, earlier this morning, we, they showed that knee to knee exam, and we did that a lot in our little clinic in Pillager before I went full time at the hospital. And uh, Dr. Heidi Fletcher still does that. She does a knee to knee exam on all, all children that will come in. And it's amazing how many of the moms really appreciate it. So I, I really appreciate that, Amos, bringing that up because moms appreciate it. Yeah. You talked a little bit about the intersection of behavioral health and oral health. And I know sometimes when we refer families with children with autism or other behavioral health needs, they'll say, oh, they just basically always get sedated for their, even their preventive dental care. And I'm just wondering what kind of is your recommendation and how do you handle preventive dental care for clients with pretty severe behavioral and mental health? Yeah, we see a lot of severe autism and uh, group home folks and cerebral palsy. Generally, cerebral palsy, unless they're catonic or something like that and can't hold still, can be seen in the clinical setting. Autism, it depends on if it's just aut autism spectrum disorder or is it true severe autism. I see a lot of autism folks on a recall basis on, on a six to eight month recall. And uh, sometimes we have to not, we have to educate the caregivers that it's important to do that. And uh, I understand sticking a hose in somebody's nose once or twice a year is not fun, but when we have inflamed tissue and total lack of care because because of lack of cooperation or ability to cooperate, we have to see them.